Cyberwork with InfoSec has recently celebrated its 100th episode. Thank you to all of you that watch and listen and subscribe to both the audio podcast and our YouTube channel. We're so grateful to hear from all of you, and we look forward to speaking with you more about all aspects of the cybersecurity industry. To celebrate this milestone, we have a very special offer for listeners of the podcast. We're giving 30 days of free training through our InfoSec Skills platform. Go to infosecinstitute.com skills and sign up for an account or just click the link in the description below. While you're there, enter the coupon code CYBERWORK, one word, all lowercase, C-Y-B-E-R-W-O-R-K, when signing up and you will get your free access. You'll get 30 days of unlimited projects to over 500 cybersecurity courses featuring cloud-hosted cyber ranges, hands-on projects, customizable certification, practice exams, skills assessments, and more. Again, check out the link in the description below and use the code CYBERWORK, C-Y-B-E-R-W-O-R-K, to get your free month of cybersecurity training today. And thank you once again for listening and watching. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Today's guest, Kevin O'Brien is the CEO and co-founder of Greathorn, a high-growth venture-based email security company based in Boston, Massachusetts, that's focused on solving phishing, credential theft, malware, ransomware, and business email compromise for cloud email platforms, and was named a Gartner Cool Vendor RSA Innovation Sandbox finalist and InfoSec Awards Cutting Edge winner. For those of you who are well on your way up the cybersecurity career ladder, you might think that the, uh, the position of startup would be the next step. So Kevin is going to tell us about his career to this point, and some of the highlights and pitfalls of such a massive endeavor. Uh, current CEO and co-founder of email security company Greathorn, Kevin O'Brien is a frequent speaker, commentator, and author that advises customers and the public on data security and privacy issues. 20 years of deep cybersecurity expertise, most notably with CloudLock, Cisco, Conjure, CyberArk, and Stake, at Stake, Semantic. Kevin also serves as co-chair for the Mass Technology Leadership Council Cybersecurity Group. Outside of security, Kevin is a lifelong martial artist, avid skier, and amateur sailor. Kevin, thank you for being on the show today. Pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we always like to hear origin stories, and in this case, we, we definitely want to. So tell us how and when you got interested in computers and tech, and also when did security enter the mix? Yeah, sure. So I entered the security space in probably 1999. Okay. And uh, I did so as part of At Stake, and, and you mentioned that in the introduction, which Semantic acquired back in 2004. And what's unique about the At Stake story was that it was a group of hackers in Boston, uh, mm -hmm. the Loft, yeah. who uh, testified in front of the U.S. Senate in the late 1990s about their capabilities and that they could take the internet offline in, in about a half hour. Wow. And they were testifying because they were saying we shouldn't put critical infrastructure on the internet because it was so fundamentally yeah. insecure. Right. Uh, I think everyone knows that was basically ignored as a message. And so yes. consequently, you've got a, a space that created a tremendous amount of economic opportunity for guys on my side of the table and the vendor side, but you know, really not great for society at large. But I was there early and I, I was part of the initial team and was doing reverse engineering and pen testing work. And uh, probably the last time I was technically useful for anybody, but working in assembler and, and bringing things down to figure out where, uh, you know, there was actual potential to, to smash a stack and do something uh, with a code exploit. And I fell in love with cybersecurity, but I also fell in love with startups. And so mm -hmm. from there, you know, I, I, with a small deviation for, for some time in school, uh, have done startups. This is number six oh. at Greathorn, but I've, I've been fortunate in that the other five that I've worked at have all been successfully exited. And so I've had this opportunity to really have a bunch of different roles, and we'll talk more about that. But you know, my origin story is that it's working alongside uh, a bunch of Greyhat hackers who hmm. are tremendous folks. I'm still friends with a number of them, and uh, they've gone on to found big companies like yeah. Barracode or carbon black, whatever. So there's just this great group of, of folks that I got to know in the Boston cybersecurity community, right, as I was starting my career. And it probably changed the course of my life because, you know, otherwise I would have pursued that uh, degree, which was in philosophy. And I was uh, eventually doing PhD work before I, I realized that there was just too much money in philosophy and it would, it would ruin me. Oh, so I didn't want to sell out. You so that, I, man. you know, 
all my all my philosophy friends all uh all waving their their wads in front of my face here That's um right. <laughs> yeah so yeah i guess um how did you how do you say you get you got sort of you fell in with this this group so i actually was fortunate i met one of the principals uh and and met them socially and we got to talking and i had always been a, a technologist i guess uh, not necessarily a good one, but I was always interested in it. And so, you know, if you roll the clock back, I was sitting in my family's basement in the 1980s with a Commodore 64128 uh, oh, yeah. with copies of Byte magazine and yeah. learning Next to <laughs> program in basic, right? Mm-hmm. And and in those days, every one of those magazines would come with a story and it usually involved the Russians to some degree, everything old is new again. <laughs> right. And you know, those stories were, were incomplete and you had to like finish the program and then you'd like get the answer to the puzzle and, and whatever. Yeah. And so I really thought, you know, how cool is that? And maybe because it was coming out of this Cold War era uh, timeline that, that technology and computers weren't just the thing that if you were 10 years earlier were kind of like ham radio aficionados right. working on things that you would, would play around with as tech. But it was actually starting to have this connection to national security and you know kind of what the world looked like. And of course, yep. late 1980s, you also have this infusion of the punk scene and yeah. do-it-yourself culture and all of that came together. So I mean I thought it was just the coolest thing. And and yeah. by then I met these these folks who were real, like old school hackers. And I had been on IRC in, in the nineties, the early nineties, and hanging out with some of these folks and and chatting with some of them. Um, funny side story. Uh, it turns out my wife, who I met much later in life, um, and is a family nurse practitioner and, and a very sweet woman from Texas, uh, was hanging out on IRC channels in the 90s because she was dating someone who was part of the Legion of Doom, which mm. was another hacking collective. Wow. She's not a computer technologist in any way, shape, or form, but we ended up knowing a bunch of the same people from those days. Wow. And, and so, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a fun overlap. Were they, were these, this hacking group, were these people sort of noticeably older than you, like 10 years older or were they peers? They were a little bit older than I was. So I was, okay. I was 17, 18 years old when I started uh, hanging out with the, the loft crew and, and the at state crew. And, and I think I was just old enough to be a legal employee. Um, so I was very young uh, in a lot of ways. And how did, and how did guys, they feel about hanging out with someone 10 years, 10 years younger than them? I mean, they were very nice to me. Yeah. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and so we were in the Boston area and I was going to Red Sox games with some of them. And, you know, we were launching product and we had the RSA crew circa 2000. Uh, you know, we did a private showing of, um, might have been Swordfish. I'd have to go back and look. One of those terrible oh, yeah. early, late 90s, early 2000s movies. Sure. And so we, like, we were doing things sponsored by, by the company. Uh, and so they were, they were courteous and nice. Uh, I'm sure that in hindsight, they probably were like, who is this kid who has no skills? But, uh, you know, it was, it was my start. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Uh, so how, uh, I guess you've got a, a nice long trail here. So how has the cybersecurity landscape procedurally or directionally changed since you first got involved? It's a great question. You know, uh, I think that we, one, we see that cybersecurity remains a, a top line issue. And in some ways, it has become a more serious issue. Uh, you know, remember 1999, when I got started, I had a 56K modem uh, and I had a, a computer in my my bedroom growing up. And maybe you had a phone line if you were like me that was dedicated to it. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't have a cell phone. And uh, if you were really cutting edge, maybe you had like a cell phone in a bag that was, you know, pretty large. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the world was just different and it was more offline. And, you know, the at stake uh, t-shirt that I still have somewhere it says hacker on the front and on the back it it says securing the digital economy which was our official tagline our unofficial tagline was putting a dent in the universe um, but you know that concept the digital economy can you imagine saying that today yeah. uh, but that is the economy that is not the only economy is the digital economy but the world has changed in that we now are in some ways more technological and and probably in some ways worse off because everything that you are, everything about you, if you live in a a Western civilization and increasingly anywhere on the the planet, uh, culture and civilization area, you're going to have accounts that are sold that contain data about you. And, you know, we can figure out where you drive, when you drive there, what your house looks like, how much money you make, what your uh, marital status, everything, all of that's there. 
and and this wasn't the case 25 years ago. It was and pretty so, optional still at that point. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't optional because well. the companies that would eventually emerge to own this stuff. Right. Well, in the sense in that not everyone was using it. It was optional and that there were the people who were surging ahead and those who were still clinging to the idea that it was going to be not yeah. necessary. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've still got a low digit slash dot uh, number somewhere. And yeah. most of your listeners probably don't have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and that's how, how old I feel. Right. But look, the, the thing about that is we were the technologists, but we were the counterculture. And mm-hmm. now it is to not be a technologist that would make you counterculture. So there's been an inversion of of society. And I think that's the biggest change and all the cybersecurity stuff that trickles down from that. uh, The fact that, that, you know, I can compromise an organization. I can send an email to somebody and get them to give me their credentials. And now I I am that person and I can get all of this data and I can sell it. And there's a dark web. And I mean, none of that stuff was real back then. And and it was, you know, Gibson-esque fantasy rather than, than near reality. Yeah, I guess what I meant by optional was, you know, and this also dates me, but, and maybe this is just where I grew up, but, you know, I felt like for some years there was this feeling that not everyone was going to eventually be on the internet. Like I always thought it was going to be kind of boutique in the sense that some people would be interested and get on and some people never would. I just never had this sense that like every man, woman, child is going to have an, you know, an email account, you know, or, or has yeah. interest or wants to comment or whatever. So I guess that's well, what I, mean, right. I think you're right. And so, and my point was only that, you know, it was, it was, when I say it wasn't optional, what I mean is the commoditization and the consolidation of every facet of your life yes. wasn't something that even the, the future looking technologists were really taking seriously. I mean, we sure. called it cyberspace as though, or this other thing. Yes. And, and, you know, now it is, it is everything. And so it's good if you're in security, because <laughs> what is the biggest challenge? Uh, well, okay. The biggest challenge is probably climate change. The second largest yeah. challenge I think most of us face is, is probably this idea that all of this personally identifiable information and privacy information is in the hands of, uh, you know, companies and yes. maybe not companies that are protecting that data as well as they should. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's start by talking a little bit about Greathorn. What is, what does the company do that you are the co-founder of or the, you know, startup and, and what are its primary products and what's its statement of purpose? Yeah. So we are a cloud native email security company and we help global 2000 organizations protect themselves when they're using office 365 or G suite from Google uh, from advanced email threats, phishing, business email compromise, advanced malware, impersonations, account takeovers. Um, And the reason that that matters is uh, because email, which is a very old system, right? So email is interesting. Email is 50-ish years old. It's not owned by anybody. And so it's not a proprietary platform. Um, Is venerable, but it's vulnerable. And 90-ish percent plus of all data breaches that actually occur involve email in the early stages because it is the simplest way to get to almost anyone in the working world. And in today's hyper-connected uh, environments, corporate environments, your email account is probably your identity. And if I can compromise you in some fashion, I can either get you to do something that you shouldn't. And so there's social engineering tactics, or I can directly become you and I can get access to things that, that you have access to that I want to steal, or I can use your identity to then uh, you know, kind of move east west and, and escalate my privileges and do other things. And that ranges from one of our customers uh, had an individual get stopped at a convenience store because they were about to spend two or three thousand dollars in a you know small but embarrassing attack that worked on gift cards, all the way up to another customer of ours who nearly wired thirty four million dollars to an international uh, agency based on on billing, which they would never have gotten back. Yeah. Um, and we stop those things from happening. We, we help prevent the email portion of that attack. A market that's been around for 20 ish years, companies that existed when I started in the email security space, but were very much uh, sort of stagnant companies. They were yeah. perimeter security appliance tools, and they were not well adapted to the cloud ecosystem that now exists. So we said, we're going to do this in a different way, and we're going to change the narrative from perimeter blocking security to a continuous risk model. And what's nice about that, and that sounds like corporate speak, but what I mean is that now we can identify before, during, and after an attack and arm an information security professional and team with the tooling they need 
to minimize their the aperture of exposure, the, the amount of time in which they're at risk based on one of these attacks being executed against their company. Okay. Uh, so you, you mentioned that you, you're, you're kind of a, uh, a serial startup <laughs> guru. Uh, you've done a number of them over the, over the years here. So uh, let's sort of get granular about the types of skills and, and jobs and experiences that you, uh, you know, that you had that were crucial in, in co-founding of Greathorn and of the places before. Like, how does the opportunity to create a company present itself and, and, and what, what are you doing at the time when, when that comes up? Sure. Um, well, first, guru is the wrong term. I have a problem. Uh, and the problem is that I'm not employable. So, uh, you know, like when, when and, and it's only sort of a joke, you mm-hmm. know, somebody who starts a company, uh, I often will tell people, look, if you can work for somebody else, go do it. Because you can get to the same rough degree of economic success and, and right. be just as satisfied, but you get a lot more sleep and it's a lot easier. Uh, yeah. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's often because you can't not be. And mm-hmm. I think that is something that, that, you know, I can look all the way back to being a kid running lemonade stands and whatever, instead of just getting a paper route. Like it, it's harder to do, but there's something about it that's in your DNA. Um, yeah. Answer do, your question do, you more dig the, do you dig the rush of insecurity? That, like the, the rush of insecurity in the sense that, you know, some people just absolutely hate routine and it's once they know how to do a thing, they move on. Is that, is that kind of what you're like? Or I don't, I don't have that, that itch where I have to do something that, that is brand new, but I do like novelty. I mean, I think everyone yeah. does, and, and we could wax philosophically about why novelty is an interesting thing. But, um, you know, look, I do things the hard way, and that's not necessarily good. My hobbies involve being armbarred and choked uh, or <laughs> learning to sail and putting my life at risk on, on the ocean and crashing through big waves. Like, yeah. why? You know, and that's just there's uh, nature, nurture, et cetera. But there's a lot going on there, and, and starting a company and, and having – that kind of environment can be incredibly rewarding. And, and it's true, like startups are the highest of highs professionally, but they're also the lowest of lows. And, mm. and you, you know, crescendo and, and fall, yes. uh, and that's hard. But the skills uh, that you asked about. Uh, mm. So I spent the vast majority of, of the 20-ish years in cybersecurity that, that I've been working as a sales engineer um, in a bunch of different companies. And so that's a really intriguing place because you're technical, but you're translating problems to the business to non-technical people you're working hand in hand with salespeople, and so you're going on the road you're meeting customers you're hearing problems firsthand but your job isn't sell 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 it's figure out what's really going on pay attention to how people are receiving a message shift the message on the fly and i think those things are really well aligned towards being good at launching products because you know what are startups but the creation of new products and offerings in highly volatile and competitive situations. And so all of the skills about listening and learning how to launch products and learning how to do those things plays in. Um, after, you know, 15 ish years as uh, I suppose a little bit less, after like 12 years as a sales engineer, I spent a, a number of years as a product marketer and then a VP of marketing and eventually a chief operating officer. But being in the marketing side, especially the product marketing side is also very useful because what you get is exposure to how products get launched and how you yeah. do qualification and how you take things and get people excited about them and, and really get people uh, enamored with doing something that is new and risky. And so I think those skills dovetail well. It's not the only path, but uh, you know, if you're a non-technical person and, and I can code, but I'm terrible at it. And, mm-hmm. and I have a technical co-founder that I've known for 20 odd years who's brilliant um, who can make up for those deficiencies. But if you're non-technical but understand how to talk to technology uh, people and, and how to talk to business people and you confuse those, uh, I think we'll see that's a pretty good place to be as a founder. Now, uh, you know, it sounds like, it, especially with the, the sort of first step, it it came down to, you know, I met a guy, he introduced me to some folks, we did this thing. You know, if you're minded towards these types of things, but there isn't a guy to meet, you know, in your area, like, how do you sort of like get yourself you know, into situations like this where you can, cause you know, obviously no one's going to do the thing all by themselves. So you, you're going to want to find a group. Like how do you, what are some, some tips or advice do you have for sort of, if you think you're the sort of person to sort of find your, your tribe? Yeah. Look, we are in probably the best time to start a technology startup in history. Yeah. You know, you can go online and you can read everything Paul Graham has ever written. I'm not a Y Combinator guy, but right. you know, Paul is, is, great and then he's written all of this stuff and you can go and start to understand this you can go and read uh you know the startup hacks that alex iskold the formerly of tech stars he's now at a, a venture firm called 2048 you know alex writes 
tons and tons of articles about all of the dynamics of starting a company and finding a co-founder and figuring out founder market fit before you get to product market fit. Um, you can b- get books. Guys like David Cohen have written books about, and Brad Feld have written books about how to structure a venture deal. And if you're going to go get funding, what's that look like? We didn't have any of that 20 years ago. And and yeah. so, you know, our venture deals were worse and our outcomes were smaller. So the starting place is to educate yourself on the structural components of building a company, which means I got to get a product. It's got to be a minimum viable product. Most likely I've got to get it out to some people. I got to get some feedback and I got to get that feedback loop going where someone's asking me for something and I build it and asking me for something and I build Mm -hmm. it. And then you can start to think about, is this viable? And the questions that you need to answer and not for the venture guys, they're going to ask these questions, but you need to understand for yourself, how big is this market? Yeah. You know, and you have to be ruthlessly honest because you have a great business in a small market, but it's probably not a venture business. It's probably a lifestyle business and that's okay. Or you can have a product that works in a huge market and, you know, it might be a venture scale business and whatever that looks like, you then start to have a strategy. Okay. I'm going to build this thing that people need. I think people need it. So I build a first version of it and I get some feedback, I get a rate on it. I might pivot. I might abandon it and do something else. And then I educate myself about the structure of what I'm doing. And so if I'm in technology, I figure out what, what I need to do from a, a capital requirements perspective. And then you can start to look at, if you don't have any connections, you know, one of the great ways of getting into the venture market, the, the you know, uh, side of it to get funded, there are accelerator programs. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I took this company through Techstars. I'm a big fan of them. And there are tons of Techstars affiliates. Uh, there's Y Combinator on the West Coast. There are smaller accelerator programs everywhere. And if you've never done it, you know, that will be one path. The other is to go work for a startup and say, look, I'm going to spend three years, but I'm going to maybe get myself to an area with some economic activity that looks like this. And that's New York or Boston or San Fran and lesser cities, uh, lesser markets in other cities. And I'm going to expose myself to this. And then I'm going to have some connections. I'm going to start to understand how this works. You, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slower than most people, I guess. It took me 20 years to, to get to that place where I felt like I know some guys on the venture side, on the tech side, and I'm, I'm going to make a go of it. And I'd been in a bunch of companies. Um, but you can also shorten that loop by getting into those areas sooner and potentially getting yourself to a point where you know the, the venture market. Uh, you know, there's a finance route too, which I don't know anything about, but there are guys mm-hmm. who go and, you know, get yeah. great careers and work at Blackstone and then find their way into venture deals. But, uh, you know, I only know the technology hard, hard way of doing it because I like doing things the hard way. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what the other parts of the team are for. Uh, so uh, we've had episodes of, you know, what's it like to be a cybersecurity analyst or an incident responder or other things. So uh, this, is, this is sort of the, uh, the, the top here. Walk me through your average day as a, a CEO of a cybersecurity startup. What are the, some of the job <laughs> responsibilities that are part of, part of your uh, sort of daily basis? Yeah, look, there's there's an answer that's different at each stage of the business. In right. the earliest days of Great Horn, when I started it, um, you know, I went to an office and we intentionally rented a very small office early on. And uh, I built sales materials and decks and tried to drum up business and wrote blog posts and did viral marketing. You know, and that's, that's sort of the uh, inception. At the same time, my co-founder was writing product and we were working on design and whiteboarding. And that's the hardest. Um, I think that phase of birthing something from nothing is, is in some ways the most difficult. Uh, the next phase of the business where you start to get some customer traction, if you're the CEO, you damn well better be in front of those customers and learning what's working and what's not. And it is on you to, uh, figure that out and qualify that and spend time there. Um, and then a little bit later, you know, you're starting to manage a team and, and your initial team may not be your ultimate team. You might not be able to afford the people that you really want to bring in, uh, or you might be able to, you might be able to convince them, but you're going to start having a people management side of that. Um, and now, you know, today we're, we're 20 plus million in venture and been around for five years and multiple millions of dollars of revenue. So my day is, uh, you know, it's varied, but I, I am up early and uh, I am doing email for the first hour or so of my day. I, I get a couple hundred emails a day. So I prioritize and delegate what I need to. Um, once I'm in the office, I'm usually spending most of my days split between talking to uh, my staff, and I've got a great leadership team, um, my direct employees, customers. Uh, I might be interviewing people because we're growing very rapidly and hiring across the board right now. Uh, there are a handful of operational and structural things that need to happen. You know, I've got a great CFO and I've got a great team, but you know, looking at 
the financials of the business and planning for the future. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is that the further down the path you are, the fewer decisions you should make directly and the more impactful those decisions should be, which means that you will spend a lot of time listening Mm -hmm. and a lot of time taking in information. And, you know, I may make a decision about over the course of a month, what are we going to be doing at, at this launch of this new product? What features does it need to have and how does it, how's it going to shake out? Uh, I'm not going to do that in a vacuum. I'm going to be talking to people and collecting that data. And, you know, I, I think that the jobs of a founder don't run out of money. So, you know, at mm-hmm. certain times you're in fundraisers. Um, and, and so job number one, keep the, keep the doors open. Yeah. Two, set the strategic vision for the company. And that means getting everybody on board. It's not done with a gavel. It's done yeah. with conversation and consensus. You know, sometimes you have to, to use the heavy hand of the, the office, but for the most part, you're trying to listen because you're probably wrong. You just don't know how yet. So hire smart people and get them to tell you what you need yes. to, to hear. And then uh, culture. You know, the third thing you do is hiring, firing, and managing culture and not doing it with lip service paid to culture, but doing it in, in the right way where the people that you spend a lot of time working with and bringing into the organization and who represent your organization externally are doing it in a way that's consistent with the values of the organization. And, and you know, ultimately those values are your values if you're the founder. So be damn sure you know what those are and, and make sure that you're managing those correctly so that the culture represents the kind of company you want to work for. You know, good work done well, as Jerry Colonna sometimes says, is right. I think the, the best part of culture. Uh, so let, let's sort of rank some of these obligations and tasks and stuff. Uh, what are your, your, the best, most interesting parts of the job as a CEO and what are the most difficult or, or repetitive things, things you don't like to do? Yeah. Um, the best part is getting to work with customers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, listening to people who have actually spent, you know, real significant money on a product that at one point in time, if you roll the clock way back to like 2014 for us, was an idea on the back of a piece of printer paper uh, that that Ray, my co-founder, and I sat down and sketched out. And now, you know, it's this big multi-million dollar international business, and we have people who are putting their careers on the line as security professionals to use our software. So making certain that we're delivering on what we say we're going to do, and that we are ahead of the curve with respect to what people need, and that we're driving a market that is in a market segment we created. There were no cloud email security companies before Greathorn, and now there's a bunch. But you know, we we created that market, and we have an obligation, I think, to set the vision for it and innovate within it. Um, that's the best part, and that happens uh, in the product management world. There's a an acronym, Nihito. Uh, nothing important happens in the office, hmm. and you know, to a degree, I think that's true, right? So that's the stuff that I love the most: uh, getting out in front of prospects and customers. Second best is working with my team. Um, and, you know, I've got an amazingly sharp group of people and I'm fortunate to work with them. Uh, I believe that you build the company you want to work for. So if you're in that seat and you're making those decisions, you are certainly getting value from the people whom you hire, but you need to deliver it too. You need to inspire and lead and listen and uh, grow people and give them opportunity to do the things you hired them to do, which means trusting them and empowering them. Um, there's operational stuff that just has to happen, right? Like yeah. you're the signer and you're the guy who, who makes sure, or the woman who makes sure that everything uh, runs and, and doing that. Uh, and that's probably my, my least favorite part. I don't mind doing yeah. it at all. Um, and I'm process oriented, but you know, it's not exciting just to be delivering X report to somebody uh, right. and, and that's fine. But uh, you know, that's probably the, the least exciting part of the day to day. I mentioned that I, I had an old roommate who wanted to be a film director and I just had the sense that he thought that being a director was the person that says action. And I was like, you know, you're going to be up at 2 AM looking at fabric swatches. Right. You know? And, and I think when people think CEO, they're just, I, I get to walk around and talk to my coworkers, you know? And so, yeah, I like to hear things like, for instance, like what are the parts of the job that you stress out over on Sunday before you, you know, before your work week, do you have, you know, things you're, Oh, I don't want to deal with this or, or is it just the process stuff? Uh, I don't mind the process stuff. I've recently been looking at fabric swatches, uh, swatches in particular, because we have a new office we're opening and we're opening a All global right. HQ and it's 17,000 plus square feet. And, um, you know, like every piece of furniture and every stitch of fabric uh, at some point crossed my desk. I have a great team. So what crossed my desk were good things to start with, but yeah, like, <laughs> you do that. Um, Sunday, that's cute. Uh, Sunday afternoon, I'm still working. Uh, okay. I wake up 
about once a week between three and four in the morning. Sometimes it's two or three times a week. Um, and I don't have interesting nightmares anymore. I have nightmares that I missed something in a spreadsheet or yep. a big customer canceled. Um, and once that happens, you know, like that, that gets in your head and, and inevitably what then happens is I get up and I say, look, I'm not going to sleep anymore tonight. So I'm just going to go and try to write down what we can do or to think about this problem or whatever. Uh, and I actually perversely kind of like it. So this is why I say, if you can not be a CEO or a founder, don't. Um, and if it's in your DNA, then you have to do it. And you're going to find that those things are in some ways interesting. I mean, I'm tired a lot, but uh, you know, that, that is the recurring step. And ultimately what I care about most more than anything else is, are we delivering on the promise we make to our customers? Customers believe in us. We're not the safe option. We haven't been around for 25 years. They're, they're betting on our ability to outperform a legacy market. And we do, and we do it consistently. And we do it really, really well, but you get a CISO of an international business who's spending seven figures on your technology, which happens you damn well better show up and work. And so yeah. that's what matters to me. And that's what, what keeps me going. So I guess you're sort of answering this for me, but what, what sort of people tend to excel in CEO positions? Like what are the, the sort of key <laughs> traits that you think? I can't answer that. No? Um, you know, I, I, I think that all of us who sit in roles like this or any role really uh, have tremendous imposter syndrome. I have worked for people a heck of a lot longer than I've worked as a CEO um, and so I can't tell you, I don't have any received wisdom. Ask me when I'm 60 or 70 and maybe I'll have an answer for you. Look, the folks that I look up to, uh, who are brilliant and have written books and have reached the apex of their careers, talk about listening and talk about leading with authenticity and talk about, uh, being customer obsessed and, and talk about humility. I think those are the characteristics that I aspire towards, but 37 years old, Chris, I can't tell you what makes a great CEO. Um, right. You know, I'm, I'm hopefully I will get there and someone will ask that question. And I'll have a sharp answer, but it's not today. Okay. Uh, so what do you uh, feel the role of professional certifications play in the enhancement of a security career? Do you think there are certain certifications that are more important for security aspirants in 2020? Depends what you want to do. Um, yeah. You know, if you are an in the trenches uh, security analyst and you're struggling to find work. And I know that happens. And I follow a lot of folks on Twitter who are aspirants and they go and get a CIS SP or they go get some other certification. I think it can be helpful. Um, I don't carry any security certifications today and it mm -hmm. wouldn't make sense for me to. Um, most of the CISOs I know might have one, might have a CIS SP. Uh, ultimately, your ability to do the job and your ability to operate within your organization are far more important than the letters after your name. Um, but breaking in to the industry, I think some of those certs can be helpful. And if you don't know anything, what they say is, I have a, a, a survey of security that I've gone through. And if I'm a CISSP or something like that, I know a little bit about a lot and I can come in and then, you know, double down on an area that I'd be focused on. But that answer is going to be really different for someone who's in the yeah. weeds doing uh, security response at a Fortune 500 in the SOC versus someone who's at a startup as the director of InfoSec and spending most of their time on compliance for GDPR. And those certifications are just very different. Okay, so um, let's turn now to some specific aspects of, of Greathorn. Uh, Greathorn, obviously, we talked about a little bit, email security company uh, focused on solving phishing, credential theft, malware, ransomware, and business email compromise for cloud email platforms. Um, and you talked a little bit about sort of some of the strategies you have, but like what kind of mechanisms or systems does your platform use to solve these type of problems? You know, if this was a, a drinking game, you'd take a drink because I'm about to say data science to machine learning and AI. Uh -huh, uh -huh, um, you know, yeah. but the thing is, Sounds everybody familiar. says that. So, you know, look, what's that really mean? Right. When you start dealing with threat, uh, you know, I was just having this conversation with, with a peer and former colleague. You can be deterministic in your risk management and security strategy. You can be prescriptive or you can be heuristic. And you can't be 100% deterministic because if you're 100% deterministic and, and you know everything, um, you, you'd be all set, right? We could just say, these are all the threats and we just solve for them. But there's no such thing. Uh, and we can do that for some degrees, like, right? So we can take TTPs and we can take IOCs, indicators of compromise, tactics, techniques, and procedures, things that are published, consume them and block them. If I could tell you every bad packet you're ever going to get is going to come from these 100 IP addresses, that's deterministic. Great. Block those. Done. Check. Right. You need some of that. Prescriptive is 
we can in real time start to understand some of those threat vectors and we can address them and Greyhorn does that. And so we have threat intelligence sources and we have things we look for using various components of our architecture and our data science platform. And that's great because prescriptive can be informed more quickly than descriptive. And you can actually start to apply that, that framework to threats that are coming in. So over email, I can tell you this is a known malicious sender. This looks like this could be uh, a threat here or there. We're going to do something with it. And then heuristic. Look, if you don't have a prescriptive or a descriptive model, then you need the data and you need to parse that data. You need to come up with a heuristic of, 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 on a spectrum between good and bad. Somewhere in there is where this thing sits. And you can't do everything in a heuristic sense because you spend all your time analyzing data. But data science and machine learning help you cut that time down and can make decisions or help you make decisions, because I don't think AI is real, uh, that will make a better uh, chance or give you a better chance of stopping something or reducing, what I said earlier, the aperture of exposure, how long you're at risk. You know, the old days, the CrowdStrike guys used to talk about the 11090, right? So you'd have one minute to detect, 10 minutes to analyze, 90 minutes to do response. Well, that idea is what this multi-tiered defense in depth model or risk management model gets to. And we do a little bit of all of that. So, you know, I can take a website, you click on a link in your email. I can run it through a convolutional neural net, which is a fancy way of saying I can compare what that looks like to a trained model of a bunch of other things and say, that looks like a Dropbox login page. And this is on some compromised WordPress site. So that's a credential theft attack. And then I can prescriptively block it. So there's some heuristic and some prescriptive. Uh, so having those different techniques are what underpin a lot of the system. And we do this for every stitch of data that you can get over at this point. We look at billions of emails on a monthly basis. And, and using all of that, we can help organizations articulate an enterprise security strategy that minimizes their risk. And then if they need to, they can use Greathorn to very quickly do response. So we talk about driving down two things, time to detection. How long does it take me? Can I get to that one minute or less time frame to see something is wrong? And time to response. How quickly can I go and, and respond and deal with this? I had another question, but I, I you stopped me in my tracks. What do you mean by <laughs> AI doesn't exist? <laughs> oh, um, so look, there's, there's, uh, I'm, I may be overstating this a little sure. bit, but when I think about it, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? And, and right. so there was a concept of artificial intelligence, that artificial intelligence is this thing that I can feed data to, and it's going to go and, and actually consume that data and, think like a human would, right? right. Which is uh, philosophically probably not possible. And uh, we could go on at length about why uh, many, not just I, think that's not possible. I think at best we're at an augmented intelligence level where we can say, look, we can take that kind of information, feed it into something that maybe I can't even really tell you why it's making the decisions it's making. Right. Uh, incidentally, that's the categorical definition of a neural net. And yet the outcomes are, are pretty well aligned to what a human would do. Um, but that's not artificial intelligence. And yeah. there's a, an argument there. A lot of companies are saying, because man, doesn't it sound cool that we have an AI thing? You know, there are companies right. in, in our space who even name their AI and the AI engine like <laughs> is supposed to do yes. something and they use some Greek name. And it's just an eye roll. I mean, it's, it's look, yeah. if you're a CISO, you know that's not what's happening. And you know yes. it's still human in the loop. And um, that's okay. But, you know, maybe as vendors, we could stop spewing this nonsense at, very intelligent, sophisticated buyers and just tell the truth about what it is that we're doing. And it's still valuable and helpful, even if it's not as sexy from a marketing perspective. Okay. Um, so uh, what, in your opinion, should be done to curb dangerous activity like ransomware or BEC, but currently isn't? Is there, obviously, you know, everyone should have uh, great horn products uh, on their, <laughs> their network, but what combination of tech and security awareness education do you think needs to happen to make a significant dent in the problem? Well, let's clarify that security awareness education is a compliance exercise, not a security exercise. Mm -hmm. um, over a billion dollars was spent on security awareness training in 2019. The net change between 2018 and 2019, according to a number of studies, uh, 2%. Mm -hmm. So a billion bucks for a 2% reduction in efficacy of phishing. Right. That's great. Well spent. Well done. <laughs> uh, you can't train the problem away. And so what you can do is alert someone to the problem. And, and I'll draw it out by analogy. If you've gone to elementary or primary school in the United States, then you know that at some point they brought in someone from the fire department who told you as a young child that if there's a fire in your house, you should not crawl under your bed or hide in your closet because that's a really bad strategy and you should go outside because that's a better strategy for surviving a fire. If your house burns to the ground and you're not in it, 
hey, that's better than being under the bed. Yep. Um, that's training. And yeah, sure, we should do that. We should tell people what they should do. Uh, but everybody has a smoke detector too, right? And mm-hmm. so the difference here is can I provide contextual information, not – Hey, theoretically, Chris, you could get a business email compromise email and it might look like someone you know and ask you to do something and you should do it. Well, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, but better is if you now have an integrated way of saying this email, the one you're looking at right now on your phone in the airport running onto that plane that says, I need you to send me your phone number. Or I need you to go do this thing for this customer. This is fake. And if I can tell you that, you can drive down your risk uh, significantly. And that's a big deal. That's, that's what we really want uh, someone to uh, have. And if you can do that, you can really materially drop the risk of, of being a victim of BEC. Uh, do you see any um, sort of cutting edge, uh, you know, types of deception going on right now? Are we still just seeing the same kind of send me, send me an invoice, send me this, send me that, you know, or are you seeing sort of more pernicious types of BEC or phishing, you know, coming on the horizon? Oh, we're definitely seeing more pernicious types. Um, and, and these things move all the time, right? This yeah. is why it's not a, a descriptive protection model. And it's not even a prescriptive protection model. You have to have some heuristics in here. Uh, we have seen the rise of sophisticated impersonations of business services. We have seen, we have customers who are running best of breed, incredibly expensive, securing all gateway products that they'll stand up a great horn instance and we'll see 30, 40, 50,000 threats get around those gateways because they just weren't threats when they were delivered. You know, I send you something with a URL, I, as the attacker, weaponized that URL, uh, that website. An hour after I deliver this, I send it to 10,000 people. Someone clicks on it. After it's been delivered, after I've weaponized it, it got through. That's a, a huge issue. We see out of band uh, uh, account takeovers where the attacker then has legitimate credentials into your email environment. How do we stop that? Um, stay tuned at RSA. We have some ideas about that. Uh, it comes up in two weeks. Uh-huh. So, you know, there's, there's a ton of stuff that can happen there. We see advanced voicemail phishing. Everybody gets voicemail emails these days. And so, you know, there are, uh, you know, sure, Tell is a company that does voice services and VoIP services. We see sure wave or other permutations of that. And it looks just like the real thing and it hits users. And if you go click on it, it could be a virus or it could be a credential theft attack. We see folks standing up uh, service accounts that are using services for email delivery for marketing. So I go and I look on security trails. I see that your company were built with. I see your company uses, I don't know, SendGrid, let's say. Talking mm-hmm. about SendGrid, great company, but you're using it for transactional marketing. I'm the attacker. I warm up an IP. I set something up that looks like your domain. I use SendGrid. I send it to someone inside. It gets passed because I'm passing for the same SPF address, the same IP address as your legitimate service. So it gets delivered. All that's just a fancy way of saying it looks real. And yet everything I'm doing is an attack. And so there are all of these different techniques and they shift, right? They shift yeah. every couple of weeks. And it's why this problem is so intractable and, and why companies like mine exist. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's pretty scary, but so where do you see these issues being in five or 10 years time? I mean, you know, I feel like, like spam, you know, like we get spam still, but like spam has been kind of solved. We have spam filters, we have this and that. Is this something that you think, can you envision a time where these sorts of things become more like background noise, the way you just kind of look in your filter and deal with stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I think that email is a system that with the right controls and probably not controls that are part of email, but rather sit orthogonal to email. Uh, We can make email a trustworthy system and we can do it without going down the Silicon Valley startup path of saying that we're going to replace email with something else. The beauty of email is that nobody owns it, right? Mm -hmm. The beauty of email is that it's an RFC somewhere. It's SMTP, IMAP, uh, mail exchange models that, we can set up our own server and go use, but it is vulnerable because it's so flexible, because it's so open. And there are companies that are trying to replace email. I think that's a fool's errand. I think that we shouldn't mm-hmm. do that to begin with because it is right. so good at being a communication platform. Yes. But you know, if you go in and look at things like how uh, the German mathematician Gödel talks about uh, incompleteness in mathematics, um, portraying my philosophy roots a little bit. But if you go look at this, you can see that there are uh, various theorems that uh, 
in a very reductive form state, you can't prove a given system within that system. Well, mm-hmm. email, I don't think can be made safe within the confines of email because if it's in an email header, I can spoof it. Yep. But if you have external systems and these externalities are able to observe and look at all of this, you can do it at a high enough scale, we could start to create a confidence model. Phil Zimmerman got this right in the 1990s with pretty good privacy. And this idea of a web of trust was ahead of its time, perhaps. But the idea that, you know, if you have a, a PKI infrastructure, a private key infrastructure, and two people could sign something, and I can trust those people because I'm in this web of trust, we could start to solve for encryption in that case, but also digital yep. signing. That didn't work because it's really hard to build that web of trust, but those concepts could still work. The idea of an external trusted system that observes things and provides a layer of authentication and trust over a system like email is, I think, fundamentally right. So, um, yeah, we'll get there. It's going to take a while and it's not going to be universal, but uh, it won't be done by somebody replacing email with some new system and it won't be done uh, exclusively within email. It'll be something external to it. All right. So uh, to wrap up today, if our listeners want to know more about Kevin O'Brien or Greathorn, where can they go online? So www.greathorn, G-R-E-A-T-H-O-R-N.com is the website for the company. We have a lot of information out there. Uh, we'll also be at the RSA conference in a couple of weeks. So if you're yep. listening and you're interested in security, too. drop by. You know, we've got a, a big booth and we'd love to chat and hear what you think. And uh, beyond that, uh, you can also uh, follow us on Twitter, at Greathorn. And uh, we're also on LinkedIn and, and all the other major social channels. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. Really, this was fascinating. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. All right, and thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. And for a free month of our InfoSec skills platform, which uh, you heard a little bit about in, in a promo at the start of today's show, uh, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash skills and sign up for an account. And while you're there in the coupon code, type in cyberwork, all one word, all small letters, no spaces for your free month. Thank you once again to Kevin O'Brien and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.